So before we begin, I just wanted to lead everyone in taking three deep breaths together so that we can really drop in um, and get ourselves ready for this experience, okay? Uh, so um, on my cue, just take your deep breath, start low, and, um, and then exhale, okay? Ready? Inhale. And out. And you can close your eyes if you'd like. Inhale. Exhale, and one more, inhale, and exhale. Part one, losses. Neurology's favorite word is deficit, denoting an impairment or incapacity of neurological function, loss of speech, loss of language, loss of memory, loss of vision, loss of dexterity, loss of identity, and a myriad other lacks and losses of specific functions or faculties. For all of these dysfunctions, another favorite term, we have uh, privative words of every sort. Aphonia, aphemia, aphasia, alexia, apraxia, agnosia, amnesia, and ataxia. A word for every specific neural or mental function of which patients through disease or injury or failure to develop may find themselves partly or wholly deprived. In this first section, losses, the most important case to my mind is that of a special form of visual agnosia, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. I believe it to be of fundamental importance. Such cases constitute a radical challenge to one of the most entrenched uh, axioms or assumptions of classical neurology. In particular, the notion that brain damage, any brain damage, reduces or removes the abstract and categorical attitude, reducing the individual to the emotional and concrete. Here, in the case of Dr. P, we see the very opposite of this. A man who has wholly lost the emotional, the concrete, the personal, the real, and been reduced, as it were, to the abstract and the categorical with consequences of particularly preposterous kind. What would, what would Hewlings Jackson and Goldstein have said of this? I have often in imagination asked them to examine Dr. P and, and then said, gentlemen, what did you say now?
So
Washington, and she, uh, you know, I was a big part inspired by the fact that uh, you know, she, she kissed Richie Browder. And if you knew Richie Browder, it doesn't matter. It was not a big deal in retrospect, but I was like, I'm leaving this town, I'm never coming back! And that's more or less, you know, I come back, been back, right? not to live. And um, when, she, when she passed away this year, I, I went back for the funeral, and uh, her sister, you know, we, we had been in touch a lot, and I just... I felt like I, I wanted to be in better touch with her in the previous year. We hadn't talked much. And uh, um, her sister was like, you know, I know for a fact that Angela would have wanted you to wear this Gumby costume at the funeral. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, this is hard for me because... Um, well, obviously, for obvious, obvious reasons, you don't want to wear a gum. You don't want to be the guy in the Gumby costume at the funeral, right? So it was a big struggle. I'm like torn between like saying no to that and like her sister. The thing's really about her and her family. Her mom was like, absolutely, the Gumby costume. Was like, oh, so I struggled with that. You know, I showed up there and you know she brought it with her. And at some point, you know, initially it was like there was too many people. It was just like a big, big service. Like everybody from town was there. And after kind of like, you know, the main part of it, I was like, oh, maybe I can split the difference. Now that a few people have left, I'll go and I'll, I'll put this Gumby costume on. So I went backstage, uh, there was a stage at this yeah. thing, and I went backstage yeah. and I, uh, <laughs> I, put, uh, I put on my uh, Gumby costume kind of in secret. And, uh, and then I jumped back out of it and, uh, you know, was walking around talking to people and all of a sudden it was just like everybody's trying to figure out who's the guy that you're looking for, like who's missing, you know? And I realized like nobody knew it was me, you know? Uh, people were trying to look through the eyes in there. And it was really, it was kind of fun, you know? And uh, eventually it was like, you know, people were taking pictures with me. I went, I went back and took it off and I rushed back around, you know, just in time to go... You know, hey, I heard Gumby was here, and somebody like very sincerely said, like, you just missed him. <laughs> and that was the closest in my life that I've ever come to being a superhero. Was that like? Anyway, I think I should know about that. Um. <laughs> Incredible. Good story. Thank you. Um, would anyone be interested in a bit of whiskey? We have. If so, Julia is going to you. hand a bit out while I read part two. Excesses. Deficit, we have said, is neurology's favorite word. Its only word, indeed, for any disturbance of function. Either the function, like a capacitator or a fuse, is normal, or it is defective or faulty. What other possibility is there for a mechanistic neurology, which is essentially a system of capacities and connections? Enhancement not only allows the possibilities of a healthy, of a healthy fullness and exuberance, but of a rather ominous extravagance, uh, monstrosity, the sort of too muchness which continually loomed in awakens as patients overexcited tended to, uh, disin uh, tended to disintegration and uncontrol, and overpowering by impulse, image, and will, possession, by the physiology gone wild. This danger is built into the very nature of growth and life. Growth can become overgrowth. Life, hyperlife. All the hyperstates can become monstrous. Um, abnormal movements, uh, hyperagnosia, readily become paragnosia. The paradox of an illness which can present as wellness, as a wonderful feeling of health and well-being, and only later reveal its malignant potentials, is one of the 
tricks and ironies of nature. It is one which has fascinated a number of artists, especially those who equate art with sickness. Thus, it is a theme. At once, dynastic, which persistently reoccurs in Thomas Mann, from the fervile tuberculosis highs of the magic mountain, to the uh, to the cyprical, sorry, to the cyberocultal <laughs> inspirations of Dr. Faust. I have always been intrigued by such ironies, and have written of them before, and have written of them before. Dangerous wellness, morbid brilliance, and deceptive euphoria with abysses beneath. This is the trap promised and threatened by excess. Whether it be set by nature in the form of some intoxicating disorder, or by ourselves in the form of some ex um, excitant addiction.
So yeah, excess. Um, Brian, do you have any thoughts about excess? Well, you I feel like I've been thing? typecasting. You have, time. straight up. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have some thoughts about excess. Oh. Um, so, basically I'm sitting in my room and I'm looking at a watch, a little watch on my desk. And my heart is pounding. I'm pretty sure it's going to explode. And all I'm waiting for is the second hand to make it to the next minute. And that's how I'm measuring my life at this moment right now is if I can make it to the next minute, cool, I'm alive. And then hopefully we'll make it to the next minute. So as I make it to the next minute, I can start to feel the warmth uh, kind of wash over me. And I realize, cool, I made it. I didn't die. Let's do that again. So after the actions I do a couple minutes later, I'm there and my heart's racing. And I'm looking at the second hand again, thinking, oh, fuck, just please let me make it. Heart's racing again, and I'm just thinking, fuck, oh, like, let's just see this second hand make it to the 12, and we're good. I make it again. And I continue to make it again for several hours. Um, and each time, you're convinced you're gonna die. Um, you're absolutely miserable waiting for the second rush to hit you. There's no sanity, logic, or rational there. You have no memory of the minute and a half before where you were waiting to die, but you're like, cool, I made it, let's do it again. So that's a brief glimpse into what it's like to shoot cocaine and heroin at the same time. <laughs> Part three, transports. While we've criticized the concept of function, even attempting a rather radical redefinition, we have adhered to it nevertheless, drawing in the broadest terms, contrasts based on deficit or excess. But it is clear that wholly other terms also have to be used. As soon as we attend to phenomena as such, to the actual quality of experience or thought or action, we have to use terms more reminiscent of a poem or a painting. How, say, is a dream intelligible in terms of function? The theme of this section is the power of imagery and memory to transport a person as a result of abnormal stimulation of the temporal lobes and limbic system of the brain. This may even teach us something of the cerebral basis of certain visions and dreams, and of how the brain, which Sherrington called an, an, an enchanted loom, may weave a magic carpet to transport us.
So, is it my turn to tell a story? Yes, it must be. Welcome. Come on in. Um, just talking about brains, singing songs. So, a lot of Oliver Sacks is about hallucinations, and there's a whole book. And we read it. And so that started to make us think about, like, have we ever hallucinated? And I have actually not ever done any heavy drugs, just like running the mill hot skis and whatnot. But <laughs> um, I do a really terrible vision. Uh, my eyesight's very bad. And um, when I was two, I fell down a flight of stairs. And then when I, like, popped up, my left eye was looking right up my nose. And my parents were like, oh, my God, we broke it. Ah! <laughs> so they, like, rushed me to the, to the optometrist. it's absolutely crucial. And if for some reason the empathy is not there, I have never written about anyone I disliked, or for that matter, anyone I couldn't feel my way into to some extent. Well, that's the first rule of writing fiction, too. You want people to identify with your characters. Yes. Well, I certainly find that. I know, for example, when I published The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, one of the pieces was called The Lost Mariner, Jimmy. And I literally got hundreds of letters saying, how's Jimmy? Say hello to him for me. And it was really quite extraordinary. How can people with neurological disorders shape their work environments to accommodate their symptoms? Oh, that's a big question. I was just, uh, I was just at a writing colony up in the Adirondacks, and I, read a, and I read a bit of my piece on face blindness. And I was then told a rather painful story, both painful and funny, which was that the year before, one of the residents had so liked the place that she wanted to join the staff. But it turned out that she was so face blind that she couldn't reliably recognize any of the other people on the staff or any of the people there at all, and they had to let her go. But one has to try and shape the environment. My first story in The Mind's Eye is about a woman, a very gifted musician, who actually becomes unable to recognize anything visually in the ordinary way. And yet, she has completely organized her own apartment in terms of color, size, position, and context. And so she has adapted the apartment to herself, and very successfully. Has her own struggle with ocular cancer changed the way you work and think as a doctor? I think it didn't change it essentially. It may have deepened it. We all know that we're going to die sometime, that human beings are mortal, that life has a limited span, even if one is a sea, even if one is a sea anemone. Actually, that's not so. If one is a sea anemone, mm -hmm. actually, that's not so if one is a sea anemone. Some sea anemones are 300 years old and going strong. But when you have something like this, you know it's there that it's not completely removed. And I think it's given me a paradoxical feeling of how precious life is, and how precious time is, and not to waste. I do speak more easily to other people with cancers and things because I can speak as one of them. Sure. I think one needs to have some sort of inner vision as well. When I was thinking and writing about people who are deaf um, and born deaf, I have a friend, actually a hearing, child of deaf parents, extremely fluent in both sign language and speech, who would often come along with me. When I went to the island of the colorblind, which I wrote about in another book, one of my fellow travelers was a physiologist who himself was born totally colorblind. In this way, there can be no 
uh, there can be no condescension or looking at a distance. But now my own cancer is a sort of mediator. Some of my patients at least know that I too am a patient. Although, in some sense, we're all patients.